Chris and Boys. Well, welcome back to the Christian Boys. My name is Jacob. This is Chris. And this is Brenton. Um, we're going to talk some more on this podcast. Uh, you're probably wondering why we keep changing seats, and it's just to keep it fresh. So, <laughs> <laughs> is it working? Oh, algorithm, Are help you us. Entertained? <laughs> we haven't left. <laughs> hey, the new Gladiator is coming out. So the Are you entertained? Is very timely. So. Oh yeah, nice on nice. spot with that one. Yeah. Well, so today we're going to talk about some controversial boy stuff. What um, us? I know. We Chris, never welcome talk. to the controversial boys. <laughs> hey, I'm glad to be here on this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've seen any of the things where we did that. We used to do that a lot where we call ourselves the controversial boys. So uh, I think you'll fit right in with that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, we want to talk about some things that we can disagree on. Uh, this is kind of a thousand foot view, um, especially with Chris coming on the channel. And, and we'll get into a little bit more of this. But, you know, secondary theology, we may disagree a little bit on. Um so I kind of want to ask, first off, is there been a situation in, in your life growing up, um, I know there has been for me, where secondary theology has maybe rubbed you the wrong way, or maybe you advocated a little too hard for something, you're like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that, or maybe even somebody attacked you with secondary theology. Uh, is there an instance in uh, your life where you could say, yeah, this is how this played out, and this is how I think Christ worked through it? Well, uh, I've got one that comes to mind immediately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of think I know. Um, do you? I, I don't know if I've told this story on this podcast before. Oh, maybe, um, maybe you so, just told me. But. Well, maybe. <laughs> so I grew up homeschooled. Um, so I obviously grew up with no friends under a rock, uh, as all homeschoolers do. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I feel like I'm rel- there. relatively normal. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but basically, uh, I grew up in a very conservative home, uh, politically. Mm-hmm. And um, given what we just talked about, mm-hmm. uh, it seems relevant. As I went to college... I uh, had never really had interactions with, like, l- like, like, really personal interactions with anyone who was openly uh, on the left politically here in America. I had only ever interacted with those who were very conservative, very much on the right. And so, me in my ignorance of youth, I remember distinctly a Bible study that I was a part of uh, in college where I just said very innocently and honestly, but with all the passion and fervor that I normally bring to things, I just don't understand how you can be a Democrat and a Christian. Oh, did that rub (laughs) a lot of people the wrong way. Oops. (laughs) Yeah, it was, and and, you know, over the next three years, because this is when I was a freshman, it was very early on, but over the next three years, I had a lot of deeper conversations with those on the political left as to why they actually feel like the left does align better with the views of Jesus um, and with the teachings of Jesus. And um, it gave me a really interesting perspective on how we hold our political candidates in our political parties very much as if they're primary theology when they're just, they're not, you know, whether a Christian professes to be a Democrat or Republican here in the United States and in our Western context really is ultimately secondary to adhering to the doctrines of Christ. Uh, and so that's that's definitely one area that I had to put my foot in my mouth <laughs> as far as secondary theology. Yeah, I think for me, um, the where, where my mind kind of goes on this is uh, like Bible translations. Um, so a lot of conversation around uh, what we would know as like King James onlyism, um, and this idea. Th- this is, this rubbed me the wrong way for a very long time. This idea uh, that the King James only Bible is the only Bible that can, or not not the King James only Bible, but the King James version of the Bible uh, is the only uh, actually like. Uh, divinely inspired uh, word of God, and that all other English translations are um, are, are subpar, or even the the terms used would be like demonic or uh, satanic or things like that. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations around that. So uh, largely. I'm not overly willing to break fellowship with somebody about it, um, and I typically find that I think they're a little bit more willing to break fellowship with me um, because I I push back against that kind of a view. I think uh, my background, I I come from uh, Church of Christ. I know me and you spoke about this earlier, but um, I think that I held a lot of things from that denomination as first doctrine when it should have been secondary doctrine. Um, I think that it was just um, a youth thing, like what you were saying, you know, you just don't have that wisdom in your youth. Um, 
and funny enough, it was actually <laughs> uh, different girlfriends I had through high school and college. I kept dating uh, girlfriends that have Pentecostal backgrounds. And so they were very much <laughs> like the opposite. End. And so speaking in tongues was a huge debate always. And uh, I, I, I regret a lot of things I said in those debates because they were, they were not true. And they were coming from a place of um, I want to be so far removed from the unbiblical version of it that I said it just, I basically was a cessationist. Um, now I kind of am more on the con, uh, continuationist, um, but it's a very soft version. And so looking back now, I'm like, ah, some of those arguments, that was, that was pretty wrong. I said some things I wish I could take back, but uh, yeah, it was those moments of like, okay, I didn't understand what secondary doctrine were. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe uh, if one of you guys want to take a stab at this, uh, for those that don't know, can you kind of describe what a secondary doctrine uh, would be something uh, that would be that we could disagree on and still hold faith. Yeah, kind so of like give the definition. I guess uh, one of the best definitions would just be to give examples of what would mm -hmm. be secondary. But uh, the easiest way to define what is secondary would be to define what is primary. Um, so just knowing what is actually primary to being a part of the Christian fold uh, would be adhering to certain doctrines that the Bible teaches. Um, first of all, it would be to acknowledge that there is a God uh, who is the creator and the sustainer of all the world and everything that exists, and that that creator is intimately involved in his world. That seems to be very obvious if you open the pages of scripture. Of course, you also must adhere to um, that that creator then revealed himself uh, through scripture primarily um, to all generations so that we can know him through specifically his work through the people of Israel, and then even more particularly in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, I would also put in the primary camp that there is, um, that that God put on human flesh in the person of the Son, Jesus Christ, who was a man who lived in first century Israel, who, um, who taught and had disciples and healed the sick and uh, went up against the religious hypocrites and leaders of the day um, and even just political leaders of the day um, and ultimately was executed on a Roman cross. Um, now, even though he was executed, his disciples report that three days after his death, he rose from the dead and that he continues to live and continues to intercede for those who place their faith in him. Um, and that we are made righteous from our sin, which is our failure to live in expectation of um, the God who created us, uh, that he intercedes on our behalf to make up for our lack. Um, now, that would be like a pretty quick summation of the primary doctrine of the Bible. Uh, obviously, there is more to it, things like the virgin birth, the, the identity of God being a triunity of, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all being one being and yet three different persons. Like, there's more to primary doctrine than just that. But secondary doctrine would be anything that falls outside of those realms of like God's identity, our, um, our, like who we are, what our identity is, what our obligation to that God is, um, and then obviously the history of, um, of Israel and, and of God's redemptive work through them and through Jesus. Anything secondary, anything that's apart from those primary areas would be secondary doctrine. So we've, we've all given examples of what we would consider secondary doctrine. Um, Chris, would you add anything to that definition? No, I think it's a good definition. Um, the I think easiest way to to put it just in a way that is very um, visual and and something that we can kind of hold on to is primary doctrine is anything within uh, our theology that we're going to hold with a closed hand. Boom. Okay, so I'm not letting go of the inerrancy and infallibility of scripture. I'm not letting go of there being one God. I'm not letting go of the virgin birth. I'm not letting go of Jesus uh, being God uh, incarnate. I'm not letting go of those things. Um, secondary theology is anything that we are willing to, uh, to hold with an open hand. Um, and I would say to be gracious with one another, hopefully, ideally, um, in the con in conversation around. Mm. Um, and understanding that to have a difference of secondary doctrine or secondary theology does not make somebody not your brother in Christ. And if I could add to that too, like 
I love I love your definition of it and, and what you brought to it as well. But we all have that. We all hold the same primary doctrine, and that's why we're able to do ministry together. We're able to call each other brothers in Christ. And By we all, you mean the three of us? Yes, the three of us. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, and everyone online, you all have to agree with <laughs> yeah, us. We're all we're all in Christ like that, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I just mean our ministry that we're doing together here, that we all hold that together. So I just want to make that known that um, we, we all do. Um, now, there are going to be secondary things that we don't agree on. Um, there have been things that, uh, not so much on camera, but me and Brenton have disagreed on, and I'm sure that uh, we'll get into a Chris that we disagree on as well. Um, but I just want to make it known that that's okay. Like, secondary doctrine is okay to disagree, um, but like what you said, with um, an open hand and with a respectful way of uh, talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's let's give some exa- some more examples of secondary yeah, yeah. theology just to flesh this out a little bit. Um, the the first thing that comes to mind, which is very obvious, uh, <laughs> given that we're adding Chris here, um, Chris uh, has a very different view of soteriology, which is like basically how we're saved. Uh, obviously, we all agree that the gospel is what saves. Now the order of salvation in terms of like, uh, is it God who initiates that response? Is it humans who initiate that invitation from God? That's where there's some dis- disagreement uh, amongst different Christian, Christian traditions. Um, Chris, do you want to describe what your stance is on that? And then we'll try to <laughs> like stumble through our definition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I am what would be con- uh, traditionally known as Calvinist um, and very, Honestly, it's not a term that I overly like care for, uh, but it's a, a good way of just being able to succinctly um, uh, uh, communicate what it is that I am. And so um, from my perspective, uh, God sovereignly chooses or elects those who he is going to save. Um, and so it is in every way not a... Uh, work of ours or anything that uh, we do in order to be saved um, and so there's there's really a lot that uh, that's broken down into uh, typically we would know it as the five points of Calvinism uh, which is usually put into the acrostic of tulip um, which is total depravity unconditional election limited atonement uh, irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints, um, also known as the doctrines of grace. So this is something that I personally hold to. Um, This is really my view of uh, how somebody is ultimately saved. So you're saying you hold to all five points, is that right? Because I know there's Uh, a difference between 4.5 points. Yes, I would consider myself to be a five-point Calvinist. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, and and a lot of that, uh, the definition that you provided, I actually would agree with personally. Um, it's just I wonder if you and I have different definitions of what it means to be elect uh, and what it means to be, uh, what God's sovereignty even means. Like uh, we, we would bring different definitions to the table, but yet we can all agree that, yes, that is exactly how salvation works. Um, that works even. How we how we are saved is not a result of our works, you know, and, 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 and things like that. But again, we have different definitions of what we identify as a work. And we have different definitions of how we identify election and predestination and and the the whole conversation. Um, And really, it just comes back to church tradition. Um, you, you're right in saying that the best way to describe it is Calvinism, but really this, uh, these doctrines have their origin in St. Augustine, which is many thousands of years before John Calvin. Um, and so like, this is, uh, this is definitely an area of open disagreement that we as Christians can have fruitfully uh, have conversations about and, and ultimately come to a disagreeing stance on, but yet have unity in our worship of Christ. And that's, that's what actually I really appreciate of having you on board, Chris, is that, you know, we're not Calvinists and you are. And yet the three of us can all come together and be like, yo, we're doing this for Christ. We're doing this because we want to bring others into the knowledge of who he is. And we're far more concerned about introducing people to the way that is Jesus um, and the way that is his uh, invitation into the kingdom of in the into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we're far more interested in that than we are in proving our soteriology uh, our soteriology correct. And so that's definitely one area where we can disagree. Are there any other examples you guys can think of of just secondary doctrine? It doesn't even have to be stuff that you we disagree on. I was going to say, and, and I know that me and Brent have talked about it a lot, but another one that I know is a very hot topic button for a lot of people is uh, eschatology. Mm-hmm. Um, do y'all kind of want to go over where you're at on that and yeah. and maybe a little bit of what that is too. Um, sure. Maybe I'll just start with that as eschatology is essentially your, your belief on the end time. So there's 
three main camps. It's uh, premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial, or all millennial, however you want to say it. <laughs> um, and they kind of go into different ways in which uh, Christ is victorious. Um, and I also want to state that at the beginning, too, is in all three of them, Christ is victorious. Yes. Um, so ultimately, whatever happens in the end, Christ is king. So um, does somebody want to kick us off? Yeah, so um, you you essentially have these these three different views, and within each of these views, you have kind of sub views that go mm-hmm. along with them. And um, one thing that I would make really clear is that like it took me a long time to settle in any respect on an eschatology, um, or, or a, more specifically, a view of the millennium. Um, largely because for a lot of my Christian life and and my studies of theology and things like that, very honestly, I just didn't care. Um, And even now in regards to my studies and things like that, it's really not super high up the list for me. Um, I would say that I take an amillennial perspective. Uh, I believe that what the Bible says about as... um, you know, as a thousand years is to God is a, is a moment to us. Um, it is very applicable to what we see in Revelation. Um, and so I, I believe that there is not, uh, I would I'm gonna say I believe very loosely here that there is not a literal millennium as is described in Revelation, but that that is something symbolic uh, within the text. Um, premillennial, the, the view of, of premillennialism essentially puts forward that the reign of Christ, the thousand year reign of Christ, uh, that that thousand years is symbolic, but that it has already begun, that we're, we're living in that period now. Um, and then postmillennialism says that that time, that, that thousand years, uh, still symbolic, has not begun. Um, and that it will begin um, with the coming of Christ. Um, And so those are really kind of the the three views, very, very flyby, very broad. Um, But yeah, I mean, people will belong to one of those camps, uh, one of those views, and I don't know that I've ever seen a a group really split over it, but... um, it definitely is a point of contention for people where they want to argue about it quite a lot. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, Brenton, what are your thoughts there? Um, well, my understanding was actually that what you just described pre and post millennialism as were reversed. Did I flip it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm pretty I, sure that pre millennialism is the, the idea that we are not yet at the millennial reign. You're correct. But yes. that yeah. Christ's return will usher in a 1000 year reign of Christ's literal reigning on earth earth and then the post-millennial view would be that once the world has been entirely christianized then christ will return so we're currently working yeah. towards that thousand year reign but we're not there yet you're correct. And that, i flipped it yep. that thousand year reign is right now it's symbolic but that it will take a long time but the world will eventually all willingly bow the knee to christ at which point he will return um i have flipped lots of different ways <laughs> in my life uh, as, to, as, as far as uh, which position I hold. Um, and again, I, I agree with what you said, Jacob. Ultimately, all of the eschatologies agree Christ is victorious in the end. So ultimately, whether it's pre-post or all-millennial uh, interpretation that ends up bearing out correct in reality, ultimately, we all end up winning <laughs> because we're all going to end up with Christ. Um, I currently hold more of a post-millennial perspective, which I think is different from you guys because you guys are both all millennial. Um, but it's not so much post-millennialism in the way that it's been historically described so much as it's, if we look at the, the trajectory of human history and we see from the time when Christianity was just a ragtag group of 100 people in the first century to today, it has consistently gone through times of uh, explosive growth and then weeding out, explosive growth further and weeding out, explosive growth, and it just keeps on progressively getting larger until to the point where we're at today where a third of all people living in the billions of people would profess Christ as Lord. Um, now, if we see that trajectory continue, we can continue to see areas of um, what where you described as trimming the fat in our last podcast, where you see some of the, the um, those who are only in it for a season and then their, their plant is scorched by the, 
the difficult seasons of life and dies away. We're going to continue to see that of times of refining and then times of, of growth and um, and revival. Um, and to me, that seems like a far more optimistic view of the future um, because ultimately there will come a day when all will bow the knee to Christ, whether that be forceful <laughs> because they're all in awe of his glory or because they choose to submit to him. Um, but either way, regardless of what uh, esch eschatological perspective you take, Christ is victorious. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those things we can hold hands on and agree that ultimately Jesus wins. Um, and we're not going to know. But we can hold different opinions on what the scripture teaches and still teach theology together. Yep. So realistically, we're all pan millennial then. <laughs> it all pan <laughs> out. All pan out the end, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what my mom likes to say all the time. <laughs> hey, mom. Love you. <laughs> um, uh, what's another area that we can think of here? Well, of, uh, before we go. I just oh, yeah. Wanna, go ahead. Sorry. Before we go to the next one, I just want to say I, I really liked what you said on the this one. You can it seems like you can hold it a little bit more loosely. And I, I kind of feel like the same way. It's one of those, you, as you learn, I think your opinions kind of change. And, and basically on you saying that, like I've seen your opinions change as we've studied and, and grown. Um, but maybe just for some reference, uh, I like how Mike Winger breaks down uh, his view of premillennialism. Uh, have you ever heard Vody Bauckham's view on amillennialism? Have you heard him explain it? Um, not that I recall. Okay. Well, I... I I would recommend him um, for those that are wanting to know these secondary doctrines and kind of more of what we're talking about, because this may be a little bit heady and quick for those that are watching right now. Um, Mike Winger is a really good one. Um, like I say, Vody Bauckham for all millennial. Do you have a good one for post millennial? Yeah. Inspiring philosophy okay. is a uh, really popular YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Jones runs that and uh, he gives a very compelling case for post millennialism. Mm. Um, that's all based on data and historical information and things like that. And, um, it, it persuaded me. Yeah. Yeah. Keith Matheson as well. Keith Matheson, uh, he was one of my professors at RBC, um, and he has a book on postmillennialism as well. Um, for amillennialism, I would also recommend Sam Storms. He has a yes, book on that as well. I agree. Sam Storms does have a really good presentation on that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give another example of where secondary theology can kind of, uh, kind of rub up against each other a little bit. Um, if we look at the historic interpretations of Christianity, there's been really two major schools of thought as far as uh, how the Bible describes God and his character. Um, and that would be the Eastern and the Western schools of thought. Um, now, obviously, we are steeped in Western culture. And so our understanding is pretty exclusively Western uh, as far as our understanding of how the Bible is taught. So um, for those who don't know, uh, it's basically what has spore, uh, what spawned out of Western theology has been uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the um, the Protestant Reformation, all of the <laughs> all of the then subgenres of Christianity that come from that, all the de denominational uh, uniqueness that we see today. But on the Eastern side, we see things like the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, we see um, more Eastern expressions in that area as well. Um, we see like the Cappadocian fathers early on in Christian history or describing more Eastern perspective on specifically God and his essences and energies, uh, which again is, is very foreign language to many in the West. <laughs> uh, but I believe that that is an area where, yeah, we don't agree on what the Bible is primarily teaching um, with regards to how God has revealed himself, yet we all can affirm the core fundamental uh, realities of God's existence and our obligation before him and Christ's resurrection and return and, and like all the primary theology that we have come to accept can be held by both the Eastern and the Western perspective. I, I don't want to speak too much on this one because I haven't really looked into the Eastern perspective as much. Um, so maybe do you have some thoughts on this, Chris? I don't mean to just pass it on to you. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, not really. Um, I'm, I'm aware of Eastern, taking a little bit more of what I could only really describe as a, sort of a spiritual approach to their their theology, um, which honestly, in a lot of ways, is very admirable. Um, and so there are there are certainly things that I, I disagree with them on, um, but I think that you have uh, an aspect of Eastern theology of Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, that really does have a certain kind of tune in to the reality of God 
making himself known through the creation uh, that I think in kind of the hustle and bustle of Western society does get lost. Yeah. yeah. I do know if I could speak on one thing, um, Catholicism, which I know is more uh, here than the Eastern side is. Um, I would say that that, and in contrast to, to our more par- Protestant views that I do enjoy their reverence for the Lord um, I do see Catholics who are genuinely seeking Christ having this severe reverence for him. And uh, I think it's something that's missed in the Protestant church um, that maybe we can take cues from. Like what you were saying with the Eastern side, we can take cues from different things. Not that we have to join hands in every doctrine that they have, but being able to take cues and go, okay, they got this point right. You know, I think that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think within the Protestant church, you do see the maybe not vast majority of differences, but you do see a lot of differences in terms of things that are secondary theology. Um, Particularly, I'd say in church governance and worship, um, Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of differences just across the board that are based out of um, a a understanding of scripture. And so, um, you know, like when we discuss the differences of like say a Pentecostal worship service versus a traditional Baptist worship service, like those look very different in a lot of cases. Um, And Jacob, you grew up in Church of Christ, where for instance, part of really what their doctrine is, is not to use uh, instruments in worship and worship is done a cappella versus uh, churches that I tend to gravitate more towards uh, is minimal in instrumental, right? So it's things like a piano or an organ, and then the singing of people. Um, and so there's differences kind of on those planes as well. And it's not all necessarily, um, you know, th- things along the lines of like, oh, does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the the identity and the the person and work of Jesus and things along those lines. Um, But rather, it's kind of even these more uh, sub-genres, which I would even call um, not even really secondary, but like tertiary. Uh, These are really kind of the third level of uh, of issues where it's like, yeah, we just don't do it that way because we just don't do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's actually a really good thing to point out is like not only do we have differences in our theology, but in in our church practice, but then also how we like the, some um, some additional church practices. Uh, like some some denominations will baptize babies, uh, some will just do sprinkle baptisms, uh, some will just say like well, let's take the Eucharist or, or like um, communion for the more <laughs> the more Protestant people uh we'll just only take that once a month we maybe we won't take it at all maybe we'll withhold it only to church members maybe it'll just be open to anyone um and then there's just different ways that we run our church in practice that can result in division if we let it but ultimately it ends up being secondary to our unity in christ and when when jesus was uh, in the upper room with his disciples in the in the gospel of john we read that that the way that the world will know that we are Christ's disciples is by our love for one another. And so my personal conviction is that anyone who bears the name of Christ, whether they're doing it um, in a manner that's worthy of him or not, is irrelevant because I don't know their heart. If they're professing the name of Christ, I need to be treating them with the utmost of respect and love and dignity, even if I can't agree with them on everything when it comes to our secondary theology. Now, if they're claiming Christ and they're going against the obvious teachings of Scripture, things like, for instance, that Jesus is God, that he physically rose from the dead, that, um, that God is triune, um, that God even created the world, you know, like, like these, these, or that we're sinners. Like, if they're going against, like, the very obvious teachings of Scripture— um, that's where I say, okay, I cannot hold hands with you on that. Now, I can still love you as a fellow member of, uh, of bearing God's image. I can still love you as a fellow human being, um, one who is one of God's offspring, as Paul puts it in, when speaking to the Areopagus. Um, but I cannot hold hands with you in unity when it comes to our fellowship in the body of Christ. You know, um, I can still love you. I can still call you to repentance, hopefully give persuasive arguments as to how I think this is what the Bible's teaching. But ultimately, uh, again, we'll be known by our love for one another. So 
that needs to be our primary objective when we're approaching people is like, how are we displaying love to these folks? Um, both by holding the truth and gentleness in tandem. Um, and that's, that's to me, my personal conviction. I know that you guys feel the same way. Yeah, I kind of had a point maybe off of, of both of what you guys said. Um, I love that you brought up the, the tertiary points and, and really getting into this realm of tradition and um, just how we function versus how do we love people well and how do we show them the true doctrines of Christ. And, and one of the things that I found coming to this church in particular and leaving a lot of the traditions I was so used to um, in particular is worship and such a different way of doing worship. And when I finally got to a place of submitting myself to what we're doing here, um, even if it's not always my go-to or what I enjoy or what gives me the fuzzies inside, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, I found great um, great worship out of it because of being willing to submit myself and say, okay, this is where God's led me. I know he's given me great teaching. He's filling me with the word. Uh, and, and the people that I'm able to impact and they're impacting me is exactly where God wants me. So I'm willing to submit myself to something I didn't enjoy at first. And now I've found a way to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to gain out of this? Um, and I've kind of shared this a little bit on here before, but, um, there's been moments where I've been able to have a completely different experience in worship and, and communion with God because of the way in which it, it was being done. Um, it, it, to get more specific is actually just having a moment to be able to sit and, and just weep with the Lord and say, Lord, you've brought me to this point. Um, something I wouldn't be able to do necessarily in a Church of Christ setting um, or, or looking back, probably not effectively, <laughs> um, but in the same regard, in this church I'm in, um, there's not as much of a, uh, sometimes we have it, but there's not as much of a unity in the worship. Um, it's just inherent when you have loud music going on. You, you can't hear everyone's voices. You can't have, you can't, I can't hear Brenton across the room singing <laughs> while I'm singing. And it's, it's, there is a lack of, um, the unity in that, but that's okay because it's just a different style, you know, and there's, I think there's time for, for either or, or even a minimal music, you know? Um, Do so you mean I like think perceived unity, like in that moment, it feels like, like you're not hearing the voices all together. So like there's a different, and there's a different feel to that worship or do you mean like yes and no okay. i think for some people it is just perceived but when i think the people who are truly seeking christ there's a very deep spiritual relation mm. and um it, like i say it, it's unless you've been involved in it it's, it's hard to describe mm. you know and it's like just hearing so many voices and being connected to those voices through christ and lifting them up to him is just whew, it, you know, it, it makes you uh, makes your hair rise on your arm. You know, it's like whoa. Um, when the spirit moves, yeah, yeah. When the spirit moves, that's really what it is. And <laughs> um, anyway, get it's just that really tambourine. Cool. Get <laughs> yeah. that flag. We're gonna do some ribbon worship. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, whatever, whatever works, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I guess my my whole point in I was going with that is there's a point where we have to be willing to submit ourselves to things that we don't always necessarily agree or like, you know, and, um, you know, there's going to be teachings that, you know, all of us will have to sit under at different points in times that we're like, well, I don't really agree with all this. And that, but that's okay. As long as you're gaining something out of it and you're, and you're going back to what you're saying, loving those people well and showing the main doctrines, the secondary, it's okay to let it go. Yeah. So that's the mm -hmm. good analogy is holding mm -hmm. it like this versus mm -hmm. holding it like this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that there are things that I take a, um, let's say semi open hand regarding. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, my, my view of salvation and things like that, it's kind of a semi open hand. Like it very largely structures a lot of, not, not just my view of salvation, but ultimately I'm, I'm the, the term would be reformed in general. And so that really permeates more than just the salvation question um, and really has an impact in pretty much every area of my theology and my church attendance and things like that. But the church that I attend is not a reformed church. Yeah. And so um, that is something that I've had to learn and really um, work within for a, a long time at this point uh, is just the reality of like my church um on a doctrinal level does not agree with my 
doctrines or the, the doctrines that I hold. Mm. And, um, and yet still I've operated within this church for coming up on six years, um, as a teacher, as a pastor, um, obviously with with doing respect to the current leadership of the church and to the doctrines that it holds while not necessarily submitting my own right not not uh not abandoning my own mm-hmm. um and so like yeah I, I have definitely been in that boat mm-hmm. uh where it's like the worship is different than the worship that i like the uh interpretation of certain passages is different than how i would interpret those passages and things like that and yet my call is not a doctrinal reform within this church. Um, My call is to shepherd the people within this church and to love them. And, uh, and I think I've done a fairly good job of, of being able to navigate that where when the question is direct, I'm, I'm going to provide a direct answer regarding what it is that I believe. Um, but still being able to, at the end of the day, uh, preach Christ and him crucified. The, the Catholic tradition has a really beautiful, um, in, con- in conclusion, because I'm really tired. I'm sure you guys are too. <laughs> but the Catholic tradition has like a really beautiful expression um, that I think is actually relevant to this conversation that we've been having. Um, it's called the beatific vision. And what that is, is the moment when we pass from this life into the next and we see Christ face to face for the first time. Um, That's called the beatific vision, when we see God in his fullness. Um, And because of Christ's sacrifice, he he has made a way for us to experience that moment and not die from the holiness of God, just enveloping our sinful nature. Um, That's something that Protestants also refer to and talk about in different language, but it's something that I think that if all of us as Christians were constantly putting that before our mind and constantly thinking about what is that moment when I pass from this etern- this life, this limited life into eternity, and when I see my Lord face to face, my Savior who loved me and died for me and united me with him um, in, in a marriage covenant and a new covenant that covers all of my faults, um, do I live in expectation of that moment? Like, do I live in anticipation and excitement for that moment? Do I look forward to seeing my Lord face to face? And do I, do, do I submit my life in a way where I can be confident he will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master? Um, that's been really transformative to me. We did a podcast a couple months ago about heaven, and um, that's been really transformative in my life uh, recently, is just keeping that vision of where we're headed in front of us. Because the more we do that, and, and the more often we do that, the more the, the divisions amongst us fall away, and the more we're able to see each other for what we are, which is members of one body, which is Christ. Um, and man, do I look forward to that moment because I know that one day when we see him, we will be like him. And I can't wait. All secondary things will fall away at that moment because we'll be like, all of it was irrelevant to who you are, Christ, to who God is in his fullness and his holiness. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah, 100%. Well, let's end on that. And if, if, if that's what you want to join today, if you want to join Christ on his mission and what he's doing, um, we would love to start that conversation with you, help you get there. Um, again, Chris is going to be a great part of this team and, and really bring God's word. And we're From so excited. 800 miles that. away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're doing the thing. So if y'all don't mind, let's, let's pray it out. And uh, uh, thank you guys for being here. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, my two brothers here that we were able to share and uh, that we are ultimately going to be with you. Uh, like Brenton said, Lord, that you just, you have and hold us, you have your people, Lord. We just look forward to that day. Um, thank you for those that are hearing this. If this sparked uh, something in them, Lord, that you would just continue to flame that spark. Uh, Lord, we just love you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.